Okay, but anyhow, okay, we can see that the number actually increases okay, for all disaster, especially for flood. If we were to look at the graph on the right hand side, the small graph, okay, we can see that the number of floods actually increases over the years. Okay, so these are the number of disaster per type okay, for different types of disaster from 1998 until 2017, which include flood, storm, earthquakes, extreme temperature, landslide, and so on. And you can see that the flood will be a very uh, so-called popular type of disaster that we actually face okay, worldwide. It's not just in Malaysia, but worldwide. Okay, then these are the top 10 countries in terms of absolute losses or right, due to disaster. Okay, so we can see that okay, the storm itself in USA actually cost $944.8 billion and so on. So these are the losses over the 10 years time right, from 1998 until 2017. Right, if you were to add up all the total losses here, the top 10, or is already amounting more than one trillion. Okay, and natural disaster with the most economic damage worldwide in 2019, or last year. So we can see that or a tropical cyclone hegebis in Japan, or which cost seventeen billion dollars and so on. So this is only for one year itself. And natural disaster worldwide with the most victims, okay, not just the, the loss in terms of money, but lives. So in India, okay, the cyclone Fanny is 20 million lives. That's a lot. Okay, but that's not all. What other challenges that we are facing? Pollutions in Earth, okay, almost every corner of Earth. Climate changes, okay, global warming, rise of sea water level, heat waves, and so on. Wildfires. If you still remember, okay, uh, early this year we still have wildfires in Australia, which cost okay lives of wildlife. Okay, then degrade degradation of water quality. Okay, although in Malaysia we sort of like still enjoying water, uh, clean water, but as reported in Slango. Okay, there are many cases that the water supply uh, got polluted and there's a discontinuity of water supply. Okay, so not just in Malaysia, okay, everywhere in the world, like UK and so on, okay, we are facing this degradation of water quality. Then we have poor air quality, okay, food security and crisis, okay, social security problems, diseases and health issues, okay, higher cost of living over the years and so on and so on. So these are the challenges they are, that we are facing. Okay, so if you look at the pollution itself, nowadays the common pollutions will be actually the plastic, the rubbish. And of course, uh, at the bottom left, bottom right uh, picture, is actually the, the leakage of oil in the ocean, causing the pollution in the ocean. Right, and of course the the smog, okay. So, which which companies are actually producing the most number of or the worst offenders of plastic pollution? Coca Cola is the the first. Right, PepsiCo, okay, will be the second, and so on. Right, this is actually based on uh, this year. Okay, the statistics based on this year. Right, based on the companies that have disclosed their packaging figures. So, how are we going to actually? handle or solve all this uh, plastic pollution if we are going to actually like uh, we are not able to come up with the solution for all this uh, because uh, every day there are a lot of coca-cola pepsi cola and so on a lot of packaging of uh, those packaged food are being consumed and producing a lot of plastic okay rubbish and pollution so we need to actually come up with a solution to all this. And in terms of climate changes, so we actually face this temperature anomaly or where the temperature okay, rises over the year. Or we have to actually be careful with this temperature anomaly. Or it is predicted if the temperature keep on increasing, then there will be more storm, more floods, okay, more cyclones and so on. So it's going to cause 
more damages to our earth, right? Cost life and money. Okay, that's why we uh, there will be a lot of efforts actually try to reduce the CO2, the greenhouse effect, and so on, right? To control the temperature and in, uh, the increase of temperature. Okay, so the rise of seawater level is also another aspect that we should actually look into that we have to pay attention. Okay, although if you were to look at the 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 level that actually increased, actually not much over the year, if you were to actually look into reports, it's just like a few mm and so on. Okay, but okay, when storms and floods actually comes in, okay, it will affect a lot of cities because we built cities along the co coastline. Right? There are many cities, big cities that are actually being built along the coastline. Okay, so these are the top 10 cities that will be okay, underwater sooner than we think. Right? The very first one will be Guangzhou, China. Second will be New Orleans, USA, Mumbai, India, Venice, Italy, Shanghai, China, and so on. Okay, so we don't know how soon it will be. Like Jakarta, Jakarta is actually sinking. They are actually going to move their, their city to somewhere in Kalimantan. So very soon, a lot of cities will be underwater. Especially when actually storms come, so we are we able to like uh, prevent all this? Or basically, we can't really prevent all this. The most is actually control. We have certain level of controls. Okay, but we need to actually think of solution to all this. So another aspect: the countries facing the most ecological threats. Okay, by in 2020. So you can see that basically almost every corner in this earth is actually facing at least one okay, illogic, Ill, illogic, uh, sorry, ecological threat, uh, at least one. Okay, so Malaysia, okay, the green is at least one. Okay, the major one will be the flood. Then how about the next 10 years? Okay, it is actually predicted Okay, the next 10 years, uh, the global risk considered the most likely in the next 10 years right, by category. The number one is still environment, extreme weather. Right? Number two is still environmental issue, climate action failure. The third one, natural disaster. The fourth, biodiversity loss. And the fifth, human-made environmental disasters. Right? In the next 10 years. Right, we are most likely to face okay, all this environmental issue. So are we going to able to like minimize the life of the loss of life and also the money right, due to all these disasters and so on? What are our worst possible solutions? Right, apart from those controlling or recycling, reduce the pollution and so on. Right, basically nothing much that we can do. And the effect of our effort today will can only be seen like many years later. And not all countries, not all governments, and not all people are actually conscious about protecting our earth. So it's very difficult to prevent, okay, or actually to, to save our earth. So it comes back to the question, is earth still a suitable habitat for humans beyond next 50 years? Or if it is not so suitable or for next 50 years or next 100 years. So the question is, do we have other options? We have heard of a lot of study about actually looking for habitable exoplanets okay, outside solar system and so on. So these are the few that we have so-called, the scientists have identified, which could be the potential habitable exoplanets but doesn't mean it can definitely can be habitable, okay? Because it is actually based on the criteria, okay, that uh, these exoplanets actually fit in. At least they have like source of water and so on, and so on. So the nearest will be the first candidate, Proxima Centauri, okay, which will be four light years, okay? What that means? What does it mean by light years? Light years is basically the distance that the light will travel per year. 
we know that light travel at three times 10 power eight meter per second, right? So it covers three times 10 power eight. That means one three followed by eight zeros a meter in one second. Right? How far it will travel in one year? And to reach this Proxima Centauri, you will require four light years. So it's really, really far away. Okay, let's look at some calculation. Okay, the estimated time to reach the nearest habitable exoplanet. Okay, if you were to actually try to okay, travel from Earth or okay, using the fastest rocket, okay, which will travel at the speed of 16.26 kilometers per second, that's really fast. Okay, to reach the moon, we will require about 8.6 hours from Earth. And to reach the sun, which is 50, uh, 150 kilometer away, million kilometer away, where we will ask, roughly need 140 days, which is approximately five months. But to reach the, the first possible habitable exoplanet, Proxima Centauri, uh, which is 4.24 light years away, how long? Uh, it's estimated to be 67.4 million years. Okay, even if we were to consider to migrate to Mars, firstly is the cost. Okay, it will be shorter period of time, of course, or right, just uh, perhaps one one month. Okay, but okay, it there are a few issues that we have to actually consider. First is source of water. Second is atmosphere. Third is gravity. Okay, our body is actually adjusted to our gravitational acceleration, which is 9.80. When you move to Mars, the gravity will be lower. Then the blood circulation will be affected and so on. So the next, of course, is to build the structure for accommodation, okay, to build houses. We need to get the resources. We need to have factories to, to manufacture the bricks and so on and so on. So it can't actually be done on on the mass. That means it has to be transport, transported from Earth to the mass and so on. That will involve a lot of cost, okay, money, right, to transfer the materials, the workers to actually build, okay, the, the habitat in mass and so on. So how much that will actually cost? And, and I believe, okay, not every one of us will be affordable to actually migrate to mass then what will be the option for us, or for normal people like us? Okay, and moreover, according to Nobel Prize winner, Michel Mayer, he actually said, a human will not migrate to other planets. Right? It's not so realistic to migrate to other planets, at least not the near uh, century. So we have to be realistic. If we cannot actually migrate to exoplanet, where can we actually go? Okay, so is humanity dome? Right, where could be our future habitat? Now, since on Earth we are actually going to face a lot of these disasters and so on, okay, where is our security? Right, where can we go? Okay, so one possible solution would be we go under, right, under the water. Right? So why underwater? Let's watch a short video. You're in a city 10,000 fathoms beneath the sea. It's quite beautiful. I'm glad you feel that way, because you'll be staying here for the rest of your natural life. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold your seahorses, Captain Nemo. Although, in case of a global cataclysm such as nuclear war, a solar flare, or YouTube shutdown, humanity, those who have not taken off to Mars at least, may simply have no choice but to move underwater. Underwater cities, of course, are insanely beautiful, and the rent there is definitely cheaper than in Manhattan. Okay, so uh, this will be uh, some of the reason because of disaster and so on. So for us, right, underwater will be one of the most possible solution. Okay. You're in a city. Sorry. Okay. So first reason is seawater covers 71% of the Earth's surface. So it's actually very uh, broad and wide right, compared to the, the land on Earth. And it's quick 
and easy and cheaper access as compared to exoplanet. Do you agree on this? Right? If you were to go underworld, it is always cheaper for us right? and easy and quick right? compared to actually migrating to exoplanet. And there have been many studies done on ocean and marine. Okay, we have a lot of studies if actually search, okay, study on ocean, marine life, and so on. Okay, compared to our exoplanets, which is so far. Okay, and less natural disaster than on land. Right? On land, you will see a lot of uh, floods, la, storms, la, extreme temperature, and so on. But if you were to go underwater, then there will be no floods. Okay, there will be no tsunami underwater, okay, no storms, no extreme temperature because temperature inside the seawater is okay, below the, the surface is rather so-called stable. Okay, then existing, they are existing and under construction and planned underwater structures okay, for research, exploration, recreation, and tourism, and so on. We already have some of it and there are some planned okay, structures. Let's look at okay, those our experience are you staying underwater. Talking about the depths of the sea without mentioning the name of Jacques-Yves Cousteau would be a crime for which you'll be hanged on a sail yard. Cousteau was a French naval officer, a great explorer, oceanographer, and director. And he was the one who invented the scuba gear. In addition to stirring up the interest of the public and scientists to the ocean, it was him who first began to speak seriously about the possibility of building an underwater city. Cousteau was so keen on exploring the ocean that he created the famous Conshelf, a series of underwater houses in the 1960s. Thanks to him, other researchers were able to live underwater for several days and sometimes weeks in a row. With the development of technology, Cousteau's underwater homes became even better. The Conshelf projects two and three allowed six ocean explorers to live comfortably underwater at the depth of about 100 meters from the surface. Many were inspired by Cousteau's efforts to colonize the ocean. In 1970, a team of ocean researchers in the United States spent more than 10 days under the Caribbean Sea. And today, several underwater research laboratories are already operating around the world. But no matter how successful Cousteau and his team were in the construction of underwater housing, life in it was still not much different from everyday life in the barracks. There is very little space, food supplies are strictly limited, the only entertainment is Cousteau's silt-covered jokes, you can't leave without a mask. What a great shelter option during a global pandemic. If you want to know more about how our life will change after it, click on the pop-up above, but only in gloves. In general, life in an underwater research laboratory is still a challenge, and not everyone is ready to spend the rest of their days surrounded by bearded men and jellyfish. Okay, so we have seen that, okay, these are our past experiences, okay, that building structures under the seawater and staying overnight. Okay, so what you have seen is basically the structures, okay, the lab, okay, that actually enable some researchers to stay, okay, uh, about uh, one to two weeks time. Okay, so basically we already have studies on this and testing on living under the water. Of course, due to the, the budget and so on, so the structures will be rather small and compact. So there will be limited spaces and so on. And the type, the, the choices of food will be very limited. Okay. So these are the existing underwater structures. Okay. Like underwater restaurants in Maldives, there are actually two, okay, one in Israel. Okay. Then the top right corner, it was actually a lab converted to a, a, a lodge, okay, which you can actually pay to stay there. Okay, and also the bottom one, Florida, is actually a lab. Okay. Then this is the second restaurant under water at Maldives. It was just open uh, this year. And you can actually book at their website. Okay. So these are actually, uh, this actually shows that we actually have so-called some basic technology that enable us to build structures under the seawater. Okay, we already have that certain level of mastery in terms of technology and in terms of material that enable us to attribute structures under the water. Okay, so there are some pending projects, okay, of course, pending for 
money. Okay, they already have their designed, approved, or even registered patented. Okay, so the very first one, the Planet Ocean Underwater Hotel, okay, which they have their own website. So you can actually pay like 42,000 right, to stay in this uh, hotel for one week. And this hotel will be movable. And the, the money that, okay, uh, part of the money collected will be actually uh, used to fund the coral, right? The protection of the corals and so on. Okay, so if you're interested, you can actually look for their website. All right, the second one, okay, this one was planned to be built in Dubai, but so far it's not built yet. Uh, unlikely it will be built, which okay, is estimated to cost $45 million. Okay, so it's partially uh, above the water and then some of it, or right, the lower part will be underwater. So this is another one, okay. It's underwater research station, okay. Uh, which is planned to be built, but not sure when it will be built. Okay, it's actually just like okay, uh, the the International Space Station. It's actually model over the International Space Station, and there will be a lot of modules. Oh, so you can see the ports. Okay, each uh, in the image that there are a lot of ports that protruding out. Okay, so those are actually portable. It can be dis detached or attached to the the building structure. Okay, so the next one is also a design, the approved, the design is being approved also. So it's actually by a private company, right? And this project is actually a home, okay? a, a luxury home underwater, uh, which costs 10 million to build. So if you have the money, right, they, the company can build for you. Right? So it will be somewhere in US. Okay, so these are actually some labs, some uh, some like small homes and so on, or right? some hotel, right? But we should actually look into the the city because we are talking about our habitat. It's not for luxury or actually for recreation purpose, okay? Then are they actually projects for this like city underwater city? Actually, yes. Okay, on the bigger scale, right? This will be. Uh, one of the possible projects that will come out in the next 10 years okay, by Japan. Okay? So the researchers from Tokyo University of Japan and so on, they have actually come out with this okay, uh, five years, around five years ago. Okay? So they actually studied and they actually proposed this. So this big structure costs about $25 billion. So how are they going to actually generate energy and so on? Let's look at the video, okay, the next video. Since 1954, Japan has been continuously attacked by the huge fire-breathing pangolin Godzilla, at least in the movies. In any case, the Japanese have long been concerned about population growth and a lack of resources, and most importantly, places for people to live in. To resolve the issue, the descendants of the samurai did not ask somebody else. As usual, they did everything by themselves. Shimizu Corporation first introduced the concept of the Ocean Spiral Project in 2014 with Tokyo University and the Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science and Technology and spent the following years developing this idea. Ocean Spiral is a habitable settlement on the surface of the water that uses the resources of the ocean for complete self-sufficiency. The conceptual metropolis consists of two main elements. The first one is a spherical city with a diameter of 500 meters. The tower contains houses and jobs for 5,000 people. The second element is a spiral structure that connects this sphere to a base station at the bottom of the ocean, 2.5 miles from the surface. This element is designed to provide the city with the necessary resources, such as energy, fresh water, and food. The spiral will generate renewable energy using the Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, OTEC. This process uses the temperature difference between the colder, deeper seawater and the warmer, shallow seawater to power the electricity generator. Drinking water will be produced in a process called desalination of the reverse osmosis membrane, which uses high pressure to clean seawater, a process that naturally occurs at lower ocean depths. 
Food for the inhabitants of Ocean Spiral will be provided by large underwater farms where you can grow fish, crustaceans, and aquatic plants. In addition, the base station at the end of the spiral will be used for excavation and extraction of natural resources from the seabed. Shimizu Corporation believes that in the future, it is possible to convert carbon dioxide to methane using microorganisms that live on the seabed. This can provide additional energy for the city. It's estimated that the construction of the project will take five years and cost approximately $28 billion. The company claims that by 2030, the spiral may be ready for people to live okay. in. So, yeah, there's a slight difference in the figures, okay? It was actually first projected to be $25 billion. Now, it's actually due to the increase in cost and so on. So, at the current projection, it will be $28 billion. Okay, so it is something that they are going to build, okay, and it's believed it will be ready by 2030, which will be next 10 years. All right, how about other than this? Is there any other project? Actually, there are many. So this will be another one, which is actually very complete. Okay, it's called Sub Biosphere 2. It's designed for self sustainable underwater world. Okay, so there will be uh, uh, farm, okay, there will be uh, forest and so on, okay, to produce the, the O2 or oxygen and recycle the CO2 and so on, okay. So this will be another one on bigger scale. There are many more actually. So let's look at the criteria for a livable underwater habitat. First, we must have, for us humans, we must have uninterrupted fresh air, or right? fresh water, food supplies, right? That's the basic. The next, of course, is power and energy supply. We need energy, electricity, okay, to, to cool our, our room and so on, or for air circulation to charge our devices and so on, even to actually build transportation on okay, this system. And we also need to have sufficient physical space. It's unlike those science labs under the water. Okay? It's too compact, a limited space. Okay? For us, being a sociable, so-called beings, right? we need physical spaces. The next thing will be logistic, right? to move around. Right? Because to build underwater habitat, usually it will be modular type. That means it can be actually attached and detached easily right? for repair purpose to, or even to so-called to move, to migrate from one, from one area to another area, from one country to another country. Okay, so there'll be logistic issue or right, to transport food and so on. And then we have to consider to, to ensure that the underwater world will be still a sustainable ecosystem. We don't want to actually cause disaster on land. Then we go down into underwater and cause disaster in the underwater ecosystem. Okay, we have to learn from, from the mistake that we have done over the thousands of years. Okay, and then to avoid those mistakes when we go underwater. And then, of course, there will be, there's a need for law and orders. Okay, how, how to control the, the population in one area and so on. Okay, so these are the criteria for livable underwater habitat. Of course, there are, there, are, there are other criteria also, but these are the few so-called basic okay, criteria that we need to have, right? not, not in terms of luxury life and so on, they are not so much on the enjoyment. Right? But it's more on how to preserve the underwater ecosystem. Right? How can we live okay, with the minimum, okay? with energy supply, the air, fresh water, and so on. Okay? So to, in, other than that, okay, there are technological challenges okay, that we need to actually overcome to face. Right? So sustainable and clean sources of energy right, to power the habitat. Okay, so we, we know we need energy and power, but from where that we are going to get. So as we can see from the video, okay, the, the ocean spiral, right, they are going to get energy from two sources. Right? The first one, the main one will be actually uh, using the microbe right, from the seabed to convert CO2 into methane. Right? Methane, gas, then we will use the methane gas to power okay, the whole habitat. And the, the, the so-called complementary 
energy source for the spiral ocean, okay, will be actually from the difference of the temperature of seawater from at the top, okay, of the sea and at the bottom, okay, at the bottom of the sea near the seabed, the temperature of the seawater will be cooler. So due to the temperature difference, we were able to generate electricity, but that will be the supplementary. Okay, but the main one that proposed by the uh, this spiral ocean will be actually using the microbe at the uh, the seabed seabed there to convert the CO2 to methane. Okay, so other than this, okay, clean uh, sources of energy, we have to actually consider the technologies to generate O2 and capture CO2. Okay, so uh, there are technology to capture CO2. Okay, currently. But the technology to generate O2, of course, we can do electrolysis of the water. Okay. But for large scale, okay, it's still a challenge. Then we need to actually look to get the technology to control and maintain pressure and humidity within the habitat. Okay. So do take note that the, the structure is very big. So there will be uh, like 100 meters okay, uh, tall of the structure. So for 100 meters, the pressure will be different. The humidity will be different. So we need to actually maintain the pressure or right, inside the whole habitat for us to actually move around easily. Okay? And we need to actually like produce sufficient food and fresh water right, within the habitat without the need of depending on land. And we need to actually build the transportation underwater, okay? underwater transportation and communication. Right, on on land, we can actually use satellite, right? which is uh, the satellites are actually using gigahertz frequency. But to penetrate 100 meters down underwater will not be so easy. So there will be a need for a new type of communication, right? wire communication, and how to do wireless. Then we need to actually think of the technology to recy recycle or eliminate waste produced in the habitat. And then to control the emission of heat, light, sound, and EM radiation, electromagnetic uh, radiations into the ocean. Because when we are staying inside, of course, a lot of structures will be uh, uh, so-called glass and so on. Right? As we have activities inside the habitat, we are going to produce heat, light, okay, sound, okay, vibration, or EM radiation into the ocean. We should cause, okay, we should actually uh, cause some negative effect to the marine ecosystem. So we need to actually have technology to control all this. We cannot simply think of just building our structure, live inside. Right? We have to think how to sustain the ecosystem or right? preserve and sustain the ecosystem. Okay. Then the possible environmental impacts caused by underwater habitat. First, of course, like mentioned, it could be the pollutions, water, light, sound, EM radiation, right? garbage, and so on. Right? change in the temperature of seawater, right? change in the pH of seawater. Right? We have to know that like the, the, the corals, right? they are very sensitive to temperature, they are very sensitive to the acidity of the seawater. And we need corals to, to pr uh, preserve the marine life. It's actually the bait for many marine lives and so on. So these are the environmental impacts that if we were to move underwater, okay, it will actually possibly cause all these environmental impacts. And we need technology. We need scientists to actually study all this before we can actually like move into. So it will take years and years. But the disasters are getting more and more. So we have to act now. Okay, this is where okay, the future scientists, engineers, and technologists should actually work on. Okay? So for school kids like you all, okay, you all should actually consider if one day you are going to move underwater, okay, okay, how are you going to prepare yourself to be the future scientist, engineer, and technologist to solve all these problems, to make the underwater uh, a habitable okay, world for human beings? Okay, so this is one of the purpose of this talk also, okay, to inspire our students to think of the solution for our future. Right? And this future is not too far. Right? The, the foundation of the, the studies and research has to be started today. Okay. 
before we can actually go there, the disaster will not wait for us. Then what will be so-called the intermediate solutions for our near future, maybe the next 30, 50 years. Okay, so firstly, of course, through education and through actions of combined actions uh, from governments, countries and so on, and public, okay, to build a sustainable development, okay, on earth, right, to have sustainable development on earth. So we have to plan, okay, reduce the CO2 emission and so on. Right. The next one will be actually floating cities, right? Floating cities are cities that are being built, okay, uh, just outside the coast of the, the, the country, okay? Very near to the, the site, the coast of the country, but not too far. But they are movable, right? They'll be floating on, on the sea. So there are a few projects. They are actually uh, so-called registered patented okay, projects, okay, which some countries they are actually looking into. Of course, at the moment, around the world, we can see that there are structures being built that float. But I'm talking about city. Right? Not just one unit of hotel room or one, one house and so on. Okay? So to accommodate a lot of people okay, in the floating cities. Okay? So these are the few very big design right, structures. Right? The first one will be Oceanics. Right? Oceanics is actually a project that uh, with involvement from the... United Nations, or United Nations, or under this United UN Habitat, okay, it's a cooperation between uh, MIT, okay, and and the private company as well as the United Nations. So the next one will be actually Green Float or okay, Lily Pads, okay, and so on. So you can actually search for ten fascinating floating city concept, okay. You can see they are the the top ten projects okay so we will actually while waiting for the underwater cities okay we actually consider dual habitat society so on land and underwater okay uh, while actually not fully underwater so these are the few so-called intermediate solutions that we should actually look into so let's look at some structures of the floating cities so the very first one okay ocean next so it's actually a combination of triangle okay, area and then become a hexagon. Then combination of a few hexagons, then it actually can form a small city. And this can be joined, uh, can actually join and detach. Uh, all this unit can actually be joined and detached. And it is actually predicted that if we were to have this type of city, then I... we... Okay. Okay, if we do have this type of cities, then uh, we can actually move around easily. Okay, depends on the, the so-called rules and laws that we actually uh, willing to follow. Okay, and there are others. Okay, green float we will be actually looking something like this. Okay, this will be lily pads. Okay, see that, and so on. Okay, so these are the four that I have captured the photo. Okay, so this will be the intermediate solution that we can consider. So other resources, video resources that, okay, it will be easier for us to digest. Nowadays, we actually look for video resources uh, instead of those text, text base. So these are a few that you can actually search. What if we build cities underwater? So a lot of short videos that I actually uh, shown just now is actually from this. Right? What if we build cities underwater? So how close are we to living in the ocean? Can we live in underwater cities, or underwater city and so on? Okay, so it's about uh, time. So uh, that's all. So get your handphone ready to capture the QR code. It will be a Google form quiz, all right, about 10 questions. Very easy and short questions. If you have paid attention to my talk just now. So uh, there will be a few questions from my talk content. Okay, so if you are ready with your QR code to, to, okay, then you can actually capture the QR code here. So it's actually a short quiz. Okay, there will be five prizes up for grabs. So we will consider the, the highest scores. Okay, and submitted the period that you actually use to complete your quiz. So the top five will be actually contacted to, okay, on 14. 
right, through email. So make sure you fill in your email correctly and check your email. Okay, so thank you very much. Right. Meanwhile, if you have a question, you can actually post your question. Okay, there are a few questions from from the Zoom. Okay, first one, actually, someone mentioned underground. Okay, uh, if we were to consider flood and so on, if you were to build underground structure, then um, if the flood actually lasts for days, then it, it will be very challenging situation. Okay, and to build underground, okay, it will not be so easy. If you want to build a small so-called uh, Rome and so on is still okay, but to build a city underground, okay, it will not be so easy. Okay. Next one from okay, Dr. Faiz, will the sea storm, storm pose a threat to these underwater cities? Um, not really. It depends on the structure, but most of the structure, they already consider that they are able to withstand the, the storm. Okay, they are anchored, but they are also movable, floatable. Next one from Sakana. Okay, how much global population can Earth sustain before we move on to sea? Okay, actually depends on so-called how packed you want. Okay, if you want to as packed as like uh, Tokyo, then there will be a lot, a lot. But if you would consider all the disaster and so on, okay, we can't actually wait for the, the whole earth to be taken up by, by population, by our human population. Or we have to consider a plan. Okay, if you still remember at the front, the video, or the, the problem of deforestation, the lack of oxygen and so on and so on. So we can't really like wait for the, the earth to actually be fully populated. Yes, basically, uh, the webinar session is over. Okay, if you want to leave, yes. Okay, uh, the copy of the slide, yes, I will, the organizer, KOSF, will actually post the link in the website.
basically, first, okay, a uh, question from Adrian Lee. Okay, is there any other option rather than staying underwater? Okay, as you can see, okay, on, on land, basically, we do not have much choices with all the disasters that we, we face. Okay, and most of the cities, they are actually located near the coastal area. Okay, so it's, it's uh, exposed to flood, storms, and so on. As weather become wild, as the temperature, climate, uh, climate issues actually become more serious, then no matter where you actually stay on land, okay, we are prone to certain aspect of the disaster. Yeah, going to space, as I mentioned, is too expensive, and there are so many uncertainties, right, that in space, okay, even if you want to stay on moon. The gravity is so low, it's one, around 1.67, okay? It will actually cause problem to our blood circulation, okay? And of course, it's the very thin atmosphere on, on the moon. And there'll be a lot of meteor asteroid that actually hit the moon surface. So it's actually not safe, okay? So we have to, to move to moon, or right? It will cost more to build structure on moon to to transport human from Earth to Moon compared to go underwater. For us, we, we think that to go to space will be fun, but in actual case, it's not the case. Yeah, you're most welcome. So yeah, that's all. Thank you very much for your active participation and your interest in the topic. Okay, that's all. Uh, it will be end of this webinar. Thank you very much.